Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, after I finished my 10 part series on that amateur radio receiver, I thought I'd do something simpler. So how about a Heathkit oscilloscope calibrator? Let's check it out. Heathkit of course manufactured a wide range of kit and factory assembled products, including test instruments like an oscilloscope calibrator. Now I'm not going to go through the history of their oscilloscope calibrators. There's this Heathkit of the Month article on them that Bob Eckweather wrote a few years back, and he did a great job of detailing that bit of Heathkit history. Let's take a look at my unit. It's the IG4505, and I picked it up at a ham fest last summer as part of a package deal along with several other bargains. On the outside it looks pretty good, but I've got no idea if it still works. The graphics are in decent shape, and all the controls still move. There's some crud built up in a couple areas, which likely came from being dumped in a box with a bunch of other crap. A quick internal inspection also looks encouraging. All the parts look like they're still there, nothing looks or smells burnt, and there's no corrosion. These electrolytics in the power supply circuit are likely past their prime, so maybe I'll get away with just changing out these four caps. Hey, check this out! Not sure if this label means the unit was built by Heathkit in October of 83 or was serviced then. Either way, that pretty much confirms that it's at least 38 years old. An oscilloscope calibrator like this IG4505 is a bit of a limited utility test instrument. Its name accurately describes its intended function, but digging a bit deeper you quickly see that it's essentially just a simple function generator. And by simple, I don't mean it's primitive, but rather I mean its range of functionality is pretty simple. Let's take a look at the specs to see what I mean. It has two output signals. The first is a 200 millivolt square wave, and it's adjustable in 18 steps from a half second period to as fast as one microsecond. Or to convert that to frequency, that's from two hertz to one megahertz. Specified frequency accuracy is a decent plus or minus 0.01% with an equally decent maximum rise time of four nanoseconds. This signal is provided on a short length of coax terminated in a male BNC connector with an internal 50 ohm load. The second output signal is also an adjustable frequency square wave, but has a lower total range and adds an independently adjustable amplitude in six decade steps from one millivolt to 100 volts. A seventh position allows DC output. The specified accuracy of this output is 2% for the voltage, but has a much higher rise time at 2 microseconds maximum. And this output is provided via a very typical pair of 5-way binding posts on the front panel. So with those two output signals, you could calibrate the horizontal sweep and vertical amplifier stages of an oscilloscope, especially one that you just assembled yourself. And that's precisely, of course, what Heathkit had in mind with this product. The specs were more than adequate to cover the oscilloscopes of that era. Now going back to what I said earlier about this device having limited utility, it's pretty easy to see that it doesn't have much usefulness after you finish calibrating your freshly built oscilloscope. So I wouldn't be surprised if most of the folks who bought these either ran an electronics repair shop or maybe they bought one to share with an electronics or ham radio club. Let's take a look now at the schematic and go over how it works. The signal path starts here on the left with a 2N3393 NPN transistor being used with a 4 MHz crystal to make the master oscillator. This row of rectangles show a chain of 7400 series TTL logic chips, the 7474s are dual D flip-flops, and the 7490s are decade counters. These progressively reduce the 4 MHz signal to lower and lower frequencies. This rotary selector switch, along with this slide switch here, allow the user to select from 18 different frequency outputs. Coming off this rotary switch, we've got our adjustable frequency square wave, so what are these two transistors Q4 and Q5 doing in between the timer circuit and the output? Well, they serve a couple of functions, first of which is to generate a significantly faster rise time in the output. Recall that 5 nanosecond max rise time spec. Now I'm pretty sure the TTL logic gates of that era are definitely not that fast. Q4 and Q5 are 2N5771s, which according to this old Fairchild datasheet are quote, high-speed saturated switching transistors. 
But now here's an interesting tidbit. According to the circuit description in the manual, Q4 and Q5 are biased such that they are switched from their active regions to cut off so that they can, quote, turn on and off very quickly. Now I did a quick check of the circuit design and sure enough, R24 at 220 ohms does indeed limit the current such that Q4 and Q5 aren't able to reach saturation. Now that's interesting because I'm used to seeing transistor switching circuits oscillate from saturation to cutoff, but I guess that makes sense. Now I tried to find a reference to BJT theory online that could explain it, but I came up empty. Anyway, another good reason for using Q4 and Q5 is that the TTL output is just too high at 5 volts and would have to be level shifted anyway to get to the lower 200 millivolt spec. And also consider the range of output impedances that could be connected to the calibrator. Using this transistor pair offers a degree of isolation for the timing circuit. And speaking of output impedances, the output is connected to a short pigtail of coax which is then terminated in a BNC male connector and a cobbled in 51 ohm termination resistor. Heathcote states that this terminated cable, along with R26 and R29, provide proper impedance termination and minimizes ringing and reflections. Moving on, this section of the circuit here handles the adjustable voltage amplitude circuit. These two transistors Q2 and Q3 are driven by the same timing signal from above and switch a Zener diode shunt regulated 110 volt DC signal on and off. This voltage divider ladder determines the actual output voltage depending on the setting of this rotary control. Now because this is a simple resistor divider, the actual output voltage can be affected by the impedance of what you connect to it. However, because scopes will typically have a very high impedance input on the order of at least a megohm, a scope really wouldn't adversely load down this circuit. Now if you tried to use this on a device with a significantly lower input impedance, you can definitely expect the voltages to drop. The final portion of interest is on the lower left here. It's a dual output DC power supply. A discrete component regulator is used for generating the 5 volt DC for the logic circuit. Okay, getting back to my particular unit, I replaced the four power supply electrolytic caps. It's a straightforward replacement, although access was pretty tight inside the narrow case. There's a fifth electrolytic way down in here, it's capacitor C8 on the schematic. Getting to it will be a real pain, so I think for now I'll just leave it alone, and fingers crossed that it's still okay. Yeah, I figured I would just cut to the chase with this simple device and... Lo and behold, it works. Um, now off screen what I did, I used my dim bulb tester and I'll inlay a little video to show that uh, in action. And if you've seen a couple of my other episodes, it's a device I made that lets me uh, more safely power up recently repaired electronics. And it does have an isolation transformer in it and it's not really needed and actually doesn't really work for this device since it has a, a three prong cord. But nonetheless, I can use the variable transformer, the auto transformer rather that's in there and slowly bring up the AC and with the uh, light bulb, the incandescent light bulb, I can have kind of a safety control there to limit the amount of current. So that all worked fine, no issues. So like I said, I cut to the chase. Here it is connected to my Tektronix 2465. I've got it set for 100 microsecond um, time and lo and behold, it's working. So I'm going to run it through its paces here and show some of the other uh, quick uh, measurements and checkouts I'm going to do. But what I think I'll do, uh, I'll move the camera to get a better shot of the screen of the scope. And that's always a little tricky with these cathode ray tube scopes. Um, they get a lot of reflections, but uh, I'll give it a try uh, nonetheless and continue. Okay, I moved the camera so we can see the screen a little better. Now, I did notice one thing. I think the 51 ohm shunt resistor in that pigtail cable uh, has an intermittent connection because ever so often when I bump the pigtail, there we go, we see the circuit uh, or the signal output rather glitch a bit. So I'll try to work around that. Right now it's set at the 100 uh, microsecond uh, output or a tenth of a millisecond. Yep, tenth of a millisecond. Um, if I go to a faster speed, I see a faster signal and change the scope accordingly. There we go, 10 microseconds. Let me turn off the time indicator there. And if I go all the way to uh, one microsecond, I can easily see that as well, one microsecond per division. 
500 nanoseconds, and you can see a little bit of uh, some overshoot there. I'm going to zoom in on that on the next shot so we can look at that as well as the rise time. Okay, I've set the 4505 to one microsecond and my 2465 to 100 nanoseconds per division. And we can see some of that ringing and overshoot at both ends of the pulse. And what I wanna do now is zoom in even closer on that. 50 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds. We can really start to see it clearly now. One more step puts me at five nanoseconds. Now, I looked up the specs on my 2465 and it's specified at a 1.17 nanosecond rise time or less. And that's not a laboratory measurement that's actually using the fairly common ratio of taking the bandwidth and 0.35, divide them by each other and you get 1.17 nanoseconds. So. Nonetheless, I think the 2465's natural rise time is fast enough that we get a fairly decent measure of what the rise time of the 4505 is. So let me turn on the time indicators and let's move them around and have a closer look here. So I'll try to put this, oops, I must have it on offset mode here, that's okay. Let me try to put this at four nanoseconds and see if it fits within it. So there we go, overshot it a bit, <laughs> kind of touchy. Four nanoseconds and rough and tough, it looks like it fits in there. Remember that's from like 10% to 80%, I think is the standard. And yeah, that looks like it's fitting in there. So. No surprise, probably just confirming what is kind of obvious with this guy, but the rise time seems to be within specification. This next test is pretty simple. I'm just checking the accuracy of that voltage ladder divider circuit that's in there. So I set the time base to DC and I have my basic uh, multimeter hooked up. Now I've got it set to uh, one millivolt and that meter is not accurate enough. There's not enough digits there to be able to measure one millivolt. So kind of setting that one aside, but jumping up to 10 millivolts, that looks pretty good. And then continuing the rest of the way up, 100 millivolts is 101. One volt is 1.008, so far tracking well within the 2% spec. 10 volts, 10.09, and lastly 100 volts, 100.7. All of them look good, all of them well within 2%. Okay, and this last demo is just for fun. I've got the 4505 hooked up to my O11 oscilloscope, and before anybody starts getting a little uh, concerned here of how I'm gonna calibrate this scope, I'm not. If you're not familiar with this O11, it's a 1950-ish vintage, late 50s, maybe early 60s uh, Heath kit that was available. It's all vacuum tube. I did a restoration on this, so maybe a year ago, and I use it a lot for aligning old vacuum tube receivers when all I need is a qualitative measurement. There is no calibrated vertical amplifier or horizontal time-based sweep. In fact, the horizontal uh, adjustment is a potentiometer for horizontal gain, and vertical is also just a potentiometer. So just for fun, just to show what the square, square wave would look like on a scope this old. So that's pretty much it with this little oscilloscope calibrator. Not much more to talk about. Not sure what I'm going to use it for going forward. Like I said, it came as a package deal with about three or four other things that I got at a ham fest last summer and thought I'd just uh, check it out and see how it works. Now, I did spend a lot of time obviously talking about the quality of that square wave generated signal, so that could come in handy for some experiments or equipment checkouts in the future. But if I really can't find a use for it, I guess it'll go into the bin of stuff that I'll be selling at a ham pest at some point in the future. But at any rate, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and thanks very much for watching. So until next time, bye for now.